All right, everybody, welcome to Data Sharks. We got Rich, we got Jan. Jan yeah, he's finishing <laughs> his lunch. Jan is in the in a dark basement somewhere, unable to be uh, <laughs> to be viewed. <laughs> and then we'll have uh, we'll have Paul Mayella here join us here soon. He's he's he said he'd be just a, a few minutes late. Today we're going to be talking about uh, mistakes in data warehousing and just in and we're going to kind of go traverse the the various stages of warehousing and and uh, the the early stages. Um, I, I get a lot of exposure to the very very early stages, which is uh, working with our sales team and 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 the mistakes that are often made there. Um, and so, I'll just kick off one mistake that I that I know I've seen in the past, and that is uh, allowing the tools to drive the the narrative. Right. So, the client, um, you know, they, they're excited for this concept of a data warehouse, and so well, what kind of tools are out there? And so they just start searching for tools and then the tools are driving the narrative. Uh, and, and in many, I mean, I don't know how many times I've seen this where the the, the architecture is just so insane <laughs> just to Here's adapt. It's a really cool tool that builds this amazing chart that will do all kinds of things for you. <laughs> oh, let's build a data warehouse so we can use that. So, so what ends up happening is we'll have our solution architects, you know, uh, the, the the IT or you know program management team internally will share their future state architecture with us, and they'll they'll show us the the hammer and screw and you know all of the uh, crazy things that they have planned, and you kind of feel like you're having to walk that back, right, Rich? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that, yeah, that happens all the time. I mean. Yeah. And and the uh, what happens if if you have to implement it uh and we have run into this where it's like guys okay we will implement this I mean how many times out of 10 does it turn out that they end up saying okay I understand why we didn't want to do this Well in my experience it's 10 times out of 10 but um <laughs> you know and one of the interesting things that that we'll see sometimes also is that uh you know, somebody will find this cool new little tool, this this cool thing that they want to, you know, new technology, new thing they want to play with, and and it's it's great until you get it into a production type environment, and yeah. it's not it's not production ready. Um, you know, it it can't support the volumes or it uh, that we're that we need to deal with or um, you know all of those types of things. So you know, this kind of feeds into one of the big big issues that I see with with the uh, data warehousing projects and, and the failure of the data warehousing projects. And it's, it's just, it's the whole planning phase, right? Yeah. Why are we doing this? Um, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? Uh, you know, all of those types of things. Um, you don't spend the time up front uh, figuring out what are we trying to achieve with this? And then, and then people wonder, you know, why didn't it why, work out? Why what got built? isn't what uh you know somebody in finance needed or uh you know the the consumers on the on the other end so well and that I plays what, into it yeah go ahead go ahead Jen. i i'm sorry i i was thinking you know what what plays into that also is just sometimes uh, limited knowledge on the client's end of what a data warehouse really is and yeah. so you, you know you, you <laughs> we know exactly what we want to get out of this or what needs to be accomplished uh but i think uh you know sometimes the client has a different a different idea and then it, it, things get derailed. I mean, what are some examples? Like, what what do clients or like uh, specifically the business side? Because IT, I mean, sometimes they don't even know what it is. But but the business side, what do sometimes they mistake it to be? I think from what I've seen uh, in, in in doing data warehousing, um, I, I think people get confused between operational versus uh, analytical, um, and they have seen operational type reporting. And I think that's what we're recreating. Um, mm. and, and then you, you know, you have to under, make them understand that what we're trying to accomplish is, is we want to do uh, analysis type of reporting uh, with vast amount of volume, as opposed mm -hmm. to uh, running the operation currently with with things that really has nothing to do with analysis. Right. I, right. I think that's that's what I've seen, and and you know sometimes that's a challenge to get them on board and, and educate a little bit. Yeah, I think yeah. I think that the 
you know, often the the perception is that the data warehouse uh, also, uh, this is just another one, that the data warehouse is just going to be this giant dumping ground, you know, that we're going to just put all the data in one place. And then that's, and, and once you've accomplished that, mission accomplished, you know, and right. that's the that's the data lake assumption too. So there's a bunch of different angles, um, you know, in, in terms of mistakes. Well, and that's, Kind of like we were talking about in the in the planning phase, right? The very if you want to have a successful project, you've got to understand what are your strategic business objectives, right? What are why are we doing this? Uh, what are we trying to accomplish? You've got to have some some really clear um, insight into into where you know what are the things that you need to achieve. Otherwise, you're not going to know how to get there. One of the other things is you know when you talk about you know people understanding what a data data warehouse is. Um, you know, you get to get folks that read an article on the on the internet, and all of a sudden, you know, we're going out to design a data warehouse. One of the key things, and and one of the reasons that data warehouse projects, data warehousing projects fail, is because you don't have the right resources. Yeah. Um, you think about the modeling of a data warehouse to accomplish what Jan's talking about, where we actually want to be able to do analysis. We all we want to be able to do some of these things that aren't just you know run a quick little operational report, which is just like a listing of transactions or something like that. Uh, if you want to be able to really take advantage of that, build that right, be able to do the analysis on that, you've got to have somebody that understands what's going on, understands all those principles of data warehousing, uh, the rules that are in place, and, and be able to to model that data and and create that in a in a way that really supports the objectives that you've got. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many times I've I've said, there he uh, is. "Hey, Paul, how Paulie, you doing?" Paulie just joined us. I don't know how many times I've said we can't uh, hear him though. We can't hear him though. Here, but you, oh, yeah. turn off your mute. You're, you're muted on the app or on the. Uh, there he is. There, there you we go. go. But yeah, I don't know so, how many times I said yeah. That's a data warehouse in name only, right? I mean, that's. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just a bunch of data somewhere, and, and it's like, well, this is our data warehouse. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about what that really is. <laughs> and I think you know, I, I think what Rich is talking about too is. Um, uh, in, in many cases, if you don't have a strong uh, architectural lead, um, the project can actually get derailed if people have a different idea of, of what it really is. If they used to see certain attributes or, or certain things in, in the operational side, and now we're doing this new thing called the data warehouse, um, and they don't see those same sort of uh, same attributes, uh, they, they're wondering, why is it not there? Why can I not report on that? And I think that's mm -hmm. where the lead needs to come in and explain this is for a different purpose than yeah. what you used to see. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah, and and I think that that also uh, one of the mistakes that I uh, that I've seen several times is there's two ways you could approach this data warehousing concept, and really one of them is the right way, and the other one is possible to do, but you shouldn't do it this way. And that is approaching the data warehouse by looking at all the data that you got and saying, well we could just derive the requirements from all of this, <laughs> this, this, this data that's sitting out there. Uh, and assuming you go from this bottom up uh, approach, it's, I, I've never seen that be successful. Have you guys ever seen a successful bottom up build of a warehouse? No, no. I don't think it's possible. I, I mean, mean so first of all, that project will never end because right. how do you, how do you know, again, you don't have any objectives. And if you're taking all of the data that you've got in an organization, I mean, you just think about one system, you pull all the data from that one system. I mean, how many, how long is it going to take you to, you're going to have all kinds of dimensions, all kinds of facts. I mean, it's, that thing yeah. is just going to be huge and it's not going to be targeted at anything. So there's no way it can really be successful. So the, the real way to do this is the top down where you're, you're talking to the benefactors, the people that are going to, you know, receive the information, um, and uh, and and asking them what they want, and then map the data to that requirement, right? That's correct. But I think uh, what I ran into before is, is you you might have visionaries, uh, and they want something out of this data warehouse, and then when you actually try to marry the data to it, uh, the data cannot support that particular request. So you know, for instance. Um, they have a request where they want to see revenue by a certain dimension. 
Um, mm -hmm. But when you look at the data, your transactions might not support that dimension. And then, what are you going to so do in have, that situation? Well, in that case, you would have to uh, introduce a change um, in, in in you know in the operating system uh, on how they uh, you know how the data comes out of it. The source system needs to accommodate that. Either that, or, or or a new data capture mechanism, or you know some some new source, right? Th that's correct. But then you know to to make to make that new data source. Uh, uh, you know, if, if, to to connect it to the to the existing data, it's not always that easy. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, know. sometimes a lot of times what happens too is, oh well, well here's here's the static values for that set of you know that new dimension that you know Jan's talking about. Mm -hmm. These you know all of trust us, it's never going to change. <laughs> <laughs> right, it changes. They, change, they add, they remove. So, yeah, it's it, it's tough because. You know, you know, you're dealing with, you know, when you bring in those type of sources, you know, you're dealing with a timeline, and yeah. sometimes that timeline dictates how, how good that data source is going to be, right? Right. You know, they, we don't have the time to create a front end to give you the correct reference data for that dimension, but, you know, start off with this, and then, you know, next thing you know is, hey, you know, the, we're missing some sales from this grouping. Oh, because we didn't tell you there was a new thing to add to that grouping, you know, and then now, now you're playing, you're inserting data up, maintaining a table in the data warehouse that should be, should just flow in from the reference data or source data. So, right. Yep. Another, okay. another, uh, uh, just go, go ahead and then I'll, I'm going to give you another problem that I've seen, I've noticed. No, I was just going to maybe clarify a little bit more of what I was trying to explain. So if you currently have data, and the revenue is uh, segmented by department, I'd say. Yeah. Um, and, and now you have a uh, end user uh, that says, you know, it'd be great if we can see that revenue broken by, broken down by department and employee. Yep. Um, so great, we have the employee master data, and we have the master data for departments. But when you look at the transactions for that revenue, it's only by department. We don't have it by employee. Mm. Yeah, now, what yeah. do you do? I mean, how do you make the relationship, or how do you bring it in? So that you now break revenue or segment it by both employee and department, if your source data doesn't support it. So that's a little bit of a gotcha, gotcha. A more difficult change. Um, one of the things that I've noticed that that uh, sometimes the the data where or a, a data warehouse gets sold to the business, and this this happens within even IT departments. It gets sold as a project. Like this is a project that we're going to take on and it has a beginning and an end. And it, and they sort of fix this belief in their in their in the business's mind that once it's up and running, it's basically done. And you know, Paul, you've been at the same client for how many years now? Uh, it'll be twelve. Okay. <laughs> Same client. Uh, I, are you doing uh, different kinds of application? You know, you're you're working in data warehousing for the most part. Am I correct? Yep. Okay. Just so, that, you know, new subject areas pop up, and that's what we and, do. And they love him, right? They love him. Okay. So it's not it's not like uh, here's here's the 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 point to to drive home that it is not a project. It is a program. You're creating a program within the organization that defines how we are going to turn data into information um, over the long run. And I think, I mean, I don't know if you guys have, how, how, because you guys kind of have to, you, you come and then you you got to go to your next engagement. You know, do you see that mentality in, in organizations sometimes where they think of this as a project and not not have this, uh, a long-term view of it? Maybe not Paulie, right? Because he's been at the same client. Well, I mean, just but when, when I first got there, though, the uh, the idea was it wasn't. I mean, our project was initially you're gonna we're gonna do the initial subject area, so in this case it was sales, right? And then the next subject area, you grad you start doing knowledge transfer to the you know their group of people. You know, uh, mine's a unique uh, environment. I don't I don't think. You know, up until then was most average projects that I've been on probably were a year to, you know, one year to two years. You know, mm -hmm. this is just, you know, um, uh, I think it's more of a unique situation than the, you know, right. than the normal, obviously. But yeah, 
But yeah, I mean, we, you know, we went in with, you know, this was, this is the, the roadmap and, um, you know, we, you know, we were, we detected by subject areas, you know, obviously though, you know, before you even start the subject areas, we're, you know, we're looking at uh, the reference data, to, you know, to figure out our conform dimensions and things like that, you know, the, the really map out the, you know, the bus matrix and, uh, so we had a good idea of, you know, all the reference data that we needed, but, you know, as you know, 12 years later, you know, there's still some reference data out there that we still haven't brought in, you know, and it's kind of, right. you'd be, you'd be, you would think we have brought, like what Jan's talking about employee, we really haven't brought in any employee information yet into this data warehouse that we have, you know. Interesting. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I, Jared, to your question, I've actually see that fairly regularly. And that's one of the things. Uh, when you first start with with uh, somebody and you're working on a data warehousing type project, that's one of the things that you have to make very very clear that this this is a never ending process, right? This is a path, this is a road that we're on. We may have some uh, um, little rest areas along the way, but but then we're going to get right back in the car and keep driving. Um, yeah. And uh, because you you think about it, just the stuff that uh, Paul's talking about with with uh, you know new subject areas and those type of things and businesses are constantly evolving right the amount of data that's available is constantly evolving right like uh, you acquisitions. Know, 15, 20 years ago, well acquisitions i mean 15 20 years ago how many companies were bringing in uh, information from their twitter feed and and you know from all of these other yeah. things right that that wasn't there yeah how, all the iot devices all the it's it's the businesses are constantly changing they're constantly growing and evolving and their needs for information are going to continue to grow and evolve with that also. And so there's always going to be work to be done in a data warehousing environment. So, so here's a question. Let's say you're getting introduced to a client. What is the first indication that they really don't have a data warehouse? Like, like, let's say they give you access to their database and their schema and, you know, or not that they don't have a data warehouse, but that they have, so let's, let's explore both. But, you know, they might not have a data warehouse. And I, I'm trying to get into the nuts and bolts here for the audience a little bit. Uh, what's the first indication they don't have a data warehouse? And what's the first indication uh, that if they have a data warehouse, it, it, it was not designed right? <laughs> uh, there's one one that I love. Um, I like to go talk to the, the users, the consumers um, no, at the very beginning cool. of a project. I like to go talk to the consumers, and and one of the things that you'll hear is we'll ask them. So how do you how do you get data out of this? And oh, we've got a couple of canned reports, or we've got this dashboard. Do you get any of your own data? Well, we do, but it's difficult because if you want to look at it this way, then you have to go and do A, B, and C, and D. And if you want to look at it by month, then you have to do it this other way. And if you want to do it by division, you've got to do it another way. So there's all these rules that have been written to because the data warehouse was not designed properly it was not modeled right. properly and so your fact tables can't be uh accessed the way that you they really should be able to and so that's mm -hmm. a, that's an immediate uh, key right there you talk to the people using it and see the challenges that they have in in getting the data and and you'll hear that all the time uh well it's it returns the right data if you slice it by this, but if you try and uh, slice it by some other attribute, you got to be careful because that data is not going to be right. Right, so, and, and to your point, it's, the, um, it's a different program. They'll have they're multiple programs that do the same set of information, but like Rich is saying, sliced differently. Yeah, or you'll yeah. see, oh, so this report uh, uses this database table, oh, and that's all it's for? This <laughs> so you'll see reports that have their own database tables just for the rat report. You know, instead of being, you know, uh, more dynamic, you know, they'll say, okay, this, you know, I mean, uh, there was a client I went into, every report had its own ETL process and its own table <laughs> for it. And I think both of you hit the same thing that I've seen. So two classic examples uh, that I came across is um, uh, different stove pipes of data. So, you know, you have one department have their set of data and reports, and then the other one has the same type of information, maybe even the same dimension, maybe just sliced uh, with a few different attributes in it. So, so that was one classic. The other one was when they have one fact table and they mixed grains. So they might have mm. um, monthly information in it as well as daily information. And so, you know, you can actually get the information out of both, but 
um, you know, the monthly data could not support some of the attributes that the that the other uh, grain would support. So it, it, you know, so that's two classics that I've seen. So on the on the anal analysis side of it, this is where you get the exceptions, right? Like you can't run this report for this data because it's at the wrong grain. Is that what it would look like for the end users? Yeah, so if you look at that track table, you might have, um, uh, like I said, daily information and, they, and that daily information might have a dimension available uh, because at, at that grain, but then you step it up to maybe a, uh, to a monthly number within that same table now, but it cannot support a certain dimension. So this is a null for it or a minus one for that. Uh, yeah. But they can get the information out of there. But if we start roll things up within that fact table, none of it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. What What are some of the like if someone was to give you the schema of the, what they have in the where, warehouse? What are some of the things that just like you know, okay, this this either is or isn't a warehouse, and or if it is, uh, the guy didn't know, the person didn't know what what they were doing. I call it the Pablo Picasso schema that uh where you've got tables all over the place it looks like uh, you know, i mean it's you know you get some craziness going all over there and there's no rhyme or reason you've got you've got dimensions bridge tables between dimensions all over the place and and things that are hanging off here and there and and there's really no rhyme or reason to it uh why does that happen is it just purely lack of knowledge or is it just operational thinking as far as the like the snowflaking yes the, is it just like well, oh, i gotta solve this small problem so i'm gonna do this just for now and yeah you well know. you know sometimes you know it, yes we all we could all agree that that's sometimes bad right but then there's there's cases where for example let's say you have an item dimension in your warehouse and that item dimension is present everywhere almost every fact table is going to use an item dimension right and depending on what business you know or client you're working at so if you make a change to the item dimension think about you All know the changes what it affects right yeah so sometimes sometimes if you know down the road you know let's for example you know you got let's say pims coming into you know in the is in the rear view you know not the rear view but it's coming coming towards you and you know yeah. Because of PIM, like there's going to be massive changes that are going to happen to your, you know, to that item dimension, right? Yeah. They might even change. Just your natural key might even just change on the on the item dimension based on how they PIM, set that up. Pro product information management. It's a it's a solution set. <clears throat> but keep going. Right, but I mean that that'll sometimes dictate. Okay, well, you know what? Right now it's going to be an outrigger table, because okay. if we make a change to that item dimension, you know it's going to require a lot of regression testing. You know? well, and that's, and that's okay. And that's acceptable, but I'm going to say when you see it all over the place and, and it looks yeah. like, you know, a bowl of spaghetti, um, <laughs> like, a, you know, like a, a transactional database you would expect for the entity relationship diagram for that. You know, that's, that's a indicator that you may have a, you may be dealing with the problem there. What would right? you say if you were to kind of coach someone on the business side, to be able to kind of ring the BS meter. Um, how many dimensions do you think should a warehouse have? That's a, I realize that's a piece of string question, but like how long is a piece of string? But, but you know, to, w w when should your BS meter start ringing when, uh, you know, when you look at a, a uh, an implementation of how many dimensions a, 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 a fact table has, you know, what, where should we be ranging? I think if it relates to a fact table, uh, not so much the data warehouse in, in total, but when you Sorry, not when the fact you look, table, but the but the uh, the schema, the star schema. Right. So the schema could have many dimensions. I you know I, I don't think you can really tell just from that. But if you look at how many dimensions attached to a fact table. Right. Right. Uh, I, I think when I I think I think Kimball even refers to that as a centipede. When you uh, start seeing you know twenty twenty two, uh, I think now you're getting. Uh, that that becomes a centipede, I think. I don't know what you guys yeah. think. Yeah, anything getting towards twenty and above makes me nervous yeah, when I'm looking exactly. at that. So yeah. Now to to, to yeah, the lay person, I mean, what does go that back look to like, like? Go ahead. Well, go we ahead. used to go back like the old app days when um, we used to build cubes and stuff. I mean, you'd have requests for 
10 plus dimensions are like, all right, well, you're, you're going to get lost in the queue when you start getting that many dimensions in there, right? You have to so, remind yourself where you're at in it. You know, it's like, right. I'm looking at it by this, by this, by this, by this, by this, by this. And like, this. We're, we're like, okay, for the majority of people, you're going to use this queue. But then, you know what? If you really want to go to those more dimensions, we'll let you drill through it. Drill through <laughs> to something else, that, a more yeah, detailed yeah. queue. But yeah. Um, yeah. So what, what, because we're, we're we're talking in like I mean this is this is like alien these are alien words to a lot of people and and this does get on YouTube so you know what does that look like from an end user's perspective when there are too many dimensions what what is the experience like for the end user when that happens I would I'll say go, I'll go. go ahead John um, I was gonna say uh, you know if you have that many dimensions and you start filtering um, back to Paul's thing on the OLAP, you know, you might have a filter turned on. And then uh, as you start filtering further down the line uh, to the other dimensions, you might start seeing um, no data return. And you can understand why do I not see data? Because certain things are not applicable to, uh, you know, to that, that factor. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know what experiences you guys uh, have seen, but um, th that's one of the things I experienced before with many dimensions. Yeah, and yeah. You know, performance is another thing when you start building it, and if it's not built correctly, um, you'll you'll see a lot of issues with the performance, and and that uh, and that's one of those things that really turns the end users off. You know, they'll just I've seen where that confusion and the performance and all of those things that come from a poorly designed data warehouse, uh, then then what happens is people just go back to their Excel spreadsheets that they were using before because that's what they know and they know that those can work and and uh, they've got some control over that. So now, what would you guys say on the ETL? So, so let's just say we get through the part of, you know, architecting this thing. Um, what what are some mistakes that can happen when you cuz just for the folks that you know don't have a background in data warehousing again this is goes on youtube so you know there there is a stage where you're planning this thing and you're 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 planning both the orchestration architecture of how you're going to bring data into this system into this new database um but then there's also a, a a data architecture plan where you're defining this architecture to this target database and how the, the those tables uh, are going to be aligned um but but at some point you've got to actually build what you just planned you've got to like literally make the connections between the source databases to this target data warehouse that you've got so just let's talk about that for just a second i want to get some impressions from you guys on what are some of the mistakes that you often see when it comes to the etl side or elt side where you're building this this architecture what are some things that can go wrong there Um, I mean, I've seen places where um, instead of bringing the whole table over, they're bringing over select columns, and mm -hmm. then you get in the then you get in the the habit of okay, now we got to rebuild the table, we got to add these columns that we, you know, if you build if you bring the table over once, you know, it, it also you know it depends on obviously the size of the table and everything like that, but you know, general rule of thumb, we usually bring over the full table, and uh, depending on what type of data it is, obviously, but um i've seen that where they're constantly well we don't have that in staging we gotta go back and get it after you already staged the table right so the again for the layperson, you're having to go fetch this table from either an application database or something on the left and you need to get that into your data warehouse on the right and if you only get a few columns out of it and then uh, and then just you know weeks months later someone says oh well i need this column now uh, now you got to go and go through all of that process when you could have just grabbed the entire table all at once in one single go, uh, just grab right. all of the columns. And it's, and it's, you know, especially if it's like reference data, you know, transactional yeah. data. Okay. You know, you know, depending on what you can store in your, you know, how much you want to keep it as an archive in your staging or, you know, you know, um, or you just clean out your staging, you know, your transactional staging every day when you bring in the new transactions but as far as reference data you're reading that table every day anyways in most cases 
right? Mm -hmm. And unless you have some sort of streaming where you have changes streaming into your staging area, but for most part, if you're hitting a traditional relational database, you're 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 selecting from that table as a whole every day, checking for change. Right. Right. Anything else you can th think of on the ETL side that, that you think is kind of the big mistakes are made? Because this is where the big spend is, by the way. Yeah, I mean, I've seen, you know, there's a couple things too. It's like, you know, for, I've seen, I've seen ETL developers put all their transformation logic in a view, right? <laughs> okay. And then not in the actual tool. So, you know, one, you know, once I go, all right, well, you know, the database is going to actually do churn that better than Informatica server would or any ETL server would, right? Um, you know, or you'll see them put in, you know, for example, if we're talking Informatica, you have overrides. So you put it, you put the override in the, in the SQL override. And then when somebody's trying to troubleshoot the mapping, you're like, well, that's not what it's doing. Yeah. And then you yeah. gotta go, and then you end up like, all right, well, oh, he overrided the SQL in the source qualifier. So all of a sudden you're like, all right, now I don't understand what's going on. So sometimes it's not clear. Um, there should be, you know, um, better documentation on ETL, you know? Yeah, yeah, so that you know, uh, people are aware. And it's interesting, because that discussion is actually changing quite a bit in yeah, the data definitely. warehousing space right now, the whole ETL and ELT, and, and so there's there's a lot of things that are changing in that area. I mean, in the past, um, you know, I mean, the way we would do things is very different than the way they do things now. For example, if you're using like this cloud, cloud uh, data estate, you know, it's it's dump everything into a landing zone. Just get it all in there mm -hmm. uh, in in its raw format, and then we're going to use most likely we're going to use SQL and some orchestration uh, process to transform that data to move it into a uh, into an ODS like a data lake, and then into a, a dimensionally modeled data warehouse or or wherever we want to put that. And so so it's 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 kind of an interesting thing. Some of the sins of the past with ETL. <laughs> are going yeah. away just because of the change in the way that we're doing things with with the ability to have uh you know these cloud environments where we've got just um unlimited compute and unlimited storage yeah. but there are also new sins that are coming into play and things that you got to be careful of and and uh and it's it's interesting so so it's it's one of those things where uh, you know i would say that for data warehousing you know one of the mistakes is not staying up to date with what's going on right yeah yeah not, not keeping up to date with with the new tools the with the new environments with with the new way of doing that things. has changed so much just within the last four years it's been insane the amount of change that's happened you know it's it's totally changed i mean well take take for another example of a, of a huge mistake that we've been seeing with cloud data warehouses um is is those blind updates <laughs> yep. Exactly. I mean, talk talk about that for just a second. Like, explain what it is first for the lay audience, but then then kind of zero in well, on what it, well, what it, what it not is. Not to go into to too much detail, technical detail, but but in some of the cloud data warehouses or databases, the uh, um, you know the cloud data estates is what we like to call them. You know, data cloud. Uh, the way that they store the data is a little bit differently, and and so they they actually have where the data is, unlike a SQL Server database or an Oracle database, where if you go in and write an update statement and you update uh, some data, it's actually going in and changing that record and it's changing the value right. that it's storing in that record. In, in a data cloud, a lot of times what's happening is you write an update to a column in a table. What happens is there is no change to that existing table. What we do is we actually, a new row is actually inserted and and there's metadata that controls which one of those rows is the is the current row, and then what they'll do is they'll those prior rows will be kept in storage and kept available, um, so that you can go back to that if you need to, which is a amazing blessing. Uh, you don't have to spend all weekend because uh, somebody wrote a bad update statement to to uh, restore a backup. But what happens is is if you're updating a bunch of things, a blind update is what we talk about, which means you, you've got a, a change data capture tool or something like that that says, okay, I've got all this data. I'm just going to push it in. And, and instead of checking to see if anything's really changed, if I've got that record existing there based on this business key, I'm just going to do an update to it because then I know that I've got the latest and greatest in my, in my data warehouse. And that's and super so what common. happens is now we're, our tables get fragmented. 
uh, our storage costs are going up and it's very very common and and it was never a problem before right and, and how how uh i mean you we talked about this a couple of weeks back you know how extreme can this problem get it can get very extreme and it's it's um i mean i'm seeing the interesting thing is that i'm seeing this with in multiple instances it's not like it's just a one off yeah uh, where where somebody has some code that's doing something weird in 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 one environment or another i'm seeing number of of clients that are using cloud uh data estates that have tables that have upwards of of um you know 90 95% of the storage that's being used is all what we call that uh that uh, uh retention storage it's it's mm -hmm. so you'll have a table that's got 1 terabyte of active data and you know 50 terabytes of retention data that's not being used because you were doing blind updates so and then how does that play into the actual query speed itself well and, and, and when you, doesn't it fragment that table so that all of a sudden it's got a scan way too much you, yeah you it, it leads to a lot of different things there's table fragmentation and then there's ways to get around that you can you can reorganize those tables and cluster those tables, but there are costs that go along with that. So yeah, yeah you kind of pay compute you know, for that. So you know, you 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 either you pay the piper one way or another, right? You either design it correctly, and you uh, you know, update correctly, and you do those types of things, or you're going to have to uh, look at some other things options to to bring some things in line and uh, increase performance and and reduce costs and those types of things. So. What is the possibility of of doing periodic uh, uh, cleanups of of the storage data that was that was retained as you as you described it? Well, that's the auto clustering, right? Yep, yeah, that's auto clustering. And there are again, there are a number of things to do. There are a number of ways to do it, and and depending on the cloud provider, that that some of that storage is gonna it's gonna fall off at the other end eventually. But again, I guess the point is when we're talking about you know the mistakes in data warehousing um, is is that uh, again one of the mistakes is not staying up to date with the current technologies and what's going on around you because mm -hmm. just because we did something 10 years ago uh with a with a data warehouse um doesn't mean that that's the right answer for the way that we want to do it today yeah yeah well and it's it's uh and if you're aware of some of these problems the point is is that you don't have to rely on on you know, expensive compute processes that are designed to automate the fix because you've already planned the architecture so that it doesn't have to kick in that fix. Um, so auto clustering, for example, in Snowflake is is a is a cool, you know, solution to this problem, but it's expensive. I mean, it re it has to go and scan all of that, the you know, all of that redundancy and and clean it up, you know, and it's so it's an expensive process to be constantly running. And if you just had designed it right to, to, from the get-go, then you don't even have to incur those expenses. Right? So it's, 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 you know, it's interesting. Uh, cloud, cloud data warehousing and, and poor design in cloud data warehousing uh, is expressed in cost. It's it literally you literally pay when you say pay the piper. There's real dollars in paying the piper. Like it's real money, <laughs> and it's directly attributed to how much you pay for per query in uh in a snowflake deployment i mean i'm sure that's true like in uh you know every other kind of deployment um but because you know for example in a on-premise en engagement and we got all of our products on premise and we're not we're not using a cloud uh, warehouse poor design will express itself in terms of speed uh usually immediately um and 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 that's and that's the biggest bulk part of it because you you can't get enough scale out of what you've what you've built. The problem is in Snowflake, scale is not an issue. You can always spend more money, you know, and so the scale is purely a budgetary item. It has nothing to do with hardware. Uh, you could just continue to buy and buy and buy. And so the the issue that we found is that when we go into to some of these deployments, because they have not designed correctly, uh, they are way overspending on their on their compute. Uh, you know, I'm sure that makes some Snowflake reps happy, uh, but but you know, it causes issues. 
Well, the thing of it is, with like with Snowflake and and with Denise Tools, the the compute's there. It's available, and and you can do that. And and yeah, you can spend more, but but it's going to be you're going to be more successful if you build your data warehouse using the correct principles. You build it the right way. You design it the right way. You understand all of these things, and and uh, try not to make these mistakes that we're talking about. And then you're going to not only have a, an amazingly performant data warehouse that that uh, provides and, and meets all the objectives for the business, but you're going to be able to do it in a cost-effective way. I mean, when you're in the model of you pay for what you use, then then that's great. But let's make sure that what we're using, we're using it efficiently and we're using it wisely, um, yeah. and and not just going crazy because we can. So, have you guys seen any organizational mistakes uh, around warehousing where? It, literally the structure of how uh, the teams work with each other, where it's it's just not conducive to making it work. In other, like I'll give you an example. We we had a I remember a project where the architecture team, the the team that designed the architecture, was a completely different contractor to the team that was doing the ETL. So they they were like, there was no solid communication between the two like they were they're actually competing with each other inside the account trying to make each other look bad during the the engagement have you yeah, guys seen one. anything like that <laughs> yeah I mean, one of the things that i've seen when you talk about organizational issues with with data warehousing type projects is is that it's not being driven by the right part of the organization and we kind of led to that i uh, a data warehousing project is not an it project it's it's yeah. not a technical project. It's a business project, and it needs to be driven by the business. Um, obviously, you need the correct technical resources, but but it's I mean, and, and I don't know how many times I've seen data warehousing projects and products that uh, it's all uh, owned and sponsored and and pushed by the IT department, and and when you when that happens, it's it's because they're tired of, of creating all these ad hoc reports every time somebody needs something. Yeah, so yeah. somebody comes up with this idea and says, well, let's build an enterprise data warehouse and then we'll give that to them. And that never, it never works. It, it never actually gives the results that they actually need. And we've created more problems. So it's, it's gotta be, you know, the right person directing the right group directing this from an organizational perspective. I don't know, Paul, John, if you guys have seen some similar things to that, I think I've been fortunate uh, that, uh, you know, most of my projects are <clears throat> within one organization. You know, it's typically us going in with our folks. Uh, but, Paul, I don't know. What's what's your experience? Well, just going back to what you, you were saying, Jared, it's, I mean, I've been in a uh, client where they had contracted out the ETL developer. <clears throat> they had uh, contracted out the, the, the consulting firm that was doing the data modeling. And then they had another contractor that was overseeing both of them. And we had to come in uh, and <laughs> start working on the ETL. And it was just nothing but a mess to get one person, you know, because, you know, when you have that, all, somebody's going to get offended. Yeah. You know, especially when you're coming in there and you're like, why are you doing it this way? <laughs> you, know, you, you know, you look at it and you're like, and then all of a sudden they just get nothing but pushback. And you got the one group doesn't want to work with you because you're taking over some of their business and it, you know, um, and the other thing too, it's like, you know, with the, you know, I've seen, you know, Oh, Hey, we need this new data. Let's throw it in the data warehouse. Well, does yeah. it belong there? You know, you know, you end up, that's what, I'm, that's how you end up with reporting tables because you're pulling in some feed Yeah, yeah. that, yeah. you know, they, they can't do anything with it unless it's in the data warehouse or I've seen a lot of, um, uh, let's say system owners of the operational systems, they'll just throw, hey, well, it's, it's going to go in the data warehouse. No, it's an operational report. It probably should come from your database. It shouldn't be coming from, you know, the EDW, right? So, yeah, so that's, that's always kind of like, you know, that's like another thing you'll see, like, you know, um, the types of reporting that's coming out of the EDW, too, will tell you, yeah, yeah. okay, you know, this is just, well, a, this is. One of the things that I've been thinking about and it's something that I think we could do better at Intricity, uh, and, and it has to do with uh, 
sort of evangelizing the solution that's been built. You know, one of the one of the challenges in being on the consulting side is that you know you kind of you kind of you 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 go into this head first into a into a project. It's a program that you're starting basically, but but you know you're there to get the you know to to act as a wedge to get the pro the, the program off the road, and then and then when you're when you're done, they'll move you on, just like we talked about in our last pr uh, uh, data shark. You know, you're constantly moving to new projects, so we don't really get to see um, the evangelizing of the solution. Now, now, Paul, you're a, you're a unique case because you have, and and I I'd like to hear from you how did I mean without telling the client name and stuff, but how did that process work? How did you how did it get out there? You know, what were some of the strategies to to get it there? Well. Uh, to be honest with you, it, it took, I would say it took um, a couple of years before it became everybody wanted something with, out of the EDW, right? Or wanted a part right. of the EDW, right? You know, when we first, like, it's the first thing with subject area was sales. And obviously the first one, the first subject area is going to take obviously the longest because you're not just building Starting. sales, yeah. you're you're building, like I said, conform dimensions and things like that. Um, so it was kind of like, you know, our, we focused on a specific group, you know? And we said, okay, the first set of reporting that's going to come out of the CDW is going to be for this group, right? And then, you know, you have success stories there. You know, obviously, they're, you're 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 hoping that the most cases you're improving their business process, right? Or you're improving yeah, their day-to-day yeah. -day life, right? You know, you've all heard the stories. Well, I got to pull this data from here. I got to put it in an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> then I got to go get this data over here and put it in Excel. And you find all these... Well, this is I'm running all my decisions based on this spreadsheet and the spreadsheet has got like 50 tabs and it's got, you know, half of the tabs are for just for data dumps that go inside there and then they're building, you know, whatever the reporting inside of that spreadsheet. So, you know, you start getting those, you know, success stories of, you know, we improve, you know, I no longer have to sit there and wait to get this data. Uh, and then I have to do something once I get it. Now they just hit a button and I get my answer, you know, that what used to take them days to get to get to. So was it just so, internal word of mouth, like once they showed it, or or was there someone kind of evangelizing as they go along? Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, in that in our situation, I mean, the, well, the group that we first went to was a big group. They're a big part of the, you know. Okay. So you know, from that, they're important. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> um, and then you know, then you get you know, then eventually you get accounting and, and to buy into it. You know, you know how accounting, you know, every month yeah. and week, end of, you know, end of week, end of month, end of quarter. I mean, they, you know, they go through so much stuff that they do to just make sure all the numbers are correct, things like that. Right. And we've helped a lot with that, you know, especially on the supply chain side, you know. Mm -hmm. I think once you get to the point where um, the value is actually realized, that's when you, when you, uh, when you get that switch. I, I'm on a, on a project, uh, been on that project for the last four years. And I think in the beginning, it was a struggle as well. Uh, everybody knew we had a data warehouse and, and things eventually will come out of there. But I think once people uh, saw the value and that the data is consistent and it can be trusted, I think uh, that's when the switch occurred where uh, mm. people are very enthusiastic and they want more out of it. So, you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing similar to Paul's situation. Um, you know where you have an enterprise data warehouse and they want everything to come from it because so it's can't almost, be trusted. it almost sounds like when we go into these things you almost have to set the expectation with the with the client that there's going to be this sort of there's going to be this point where um it, it's going to we're going to it's going to be kind of frustrating because we don't have this completed yet you know there's time that has to go we have to build this um, and, and there's going to be this, this sudden change that will occur where, uh, now you're getting a value out of it. Uh, and, uh, and then you'll, and, and then you're going to start really expanding it. And it, it, I would say probably one of the mistakes that can happen is that a business, um, pulls the plug too early or chooses a subject matter that's so difficult or so challenging <laughs> to address that, that, They've essentially made it so that the organization's going to run out of gas before they reach that that inflection point. 
Um, or, the, or the scope is too large. You see that often, right? You yeah. got a good friend that says you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? Yeah. So uh, you, you'll come in and you say, all right, we're building an enterprise data warehouse. We have 50 data sources and this is, uh, we've got all these people that need all these, here's the 300 uh, reports that, that they need out of this. So let's go build yeah. it. I think yeah, yeah. I think something else is to the the uh, resistance to change. Uh, a lot of people have been at a company for many years. They used to doing uh, getting a task accomplished a certain way, spreadsheets, whatever. They know it inside out, and now all of a sudden this is data warehouse, and and there's no trust factor yet, unless you know until they get to a point where they can actually see that. But but Jan, to kind of to Jared's earlier question, I mean those are some of the those are some of the stories that I look for when I go into an organization. Is, mm -hmm. is some of those situations where we've got somebody that, that has a challenge. It's, you know, they've, they've got to, to you know, give this data. It's a difficult thing, but they've always done it. Um, I'm, one example, I, I remember I was working with a, a fuel wholesale company. Um, and you can imagine the, the volatility of prices when we're talking about fuels, uh, you know, gasoline and heating oil and all of those types of things. And uh, so there was a company that we were working with uh, that were fuel wholesalers. and <clears throat> Every night they would get new prices, and sometimes those prices wouldn't come in till later at night. And and there was one gentleman that would sit there and wait for this email to come in that that here's the new rack price for this fuel, and he had to wait for the all these prices to come in, and then he'd compile that all into an Excel spreadsheet and send that all to all of the uh, salespeople. So they the next morning they had all of the new prices, so they knew any contracts that they were setting up, they knew the contract plus you know price. And so working, when we went in there to start working on a data warehousing solution with them, we, we looked at pricing and said, look, this is, this is where we can get some wins right away. Because yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, we, we worked through that, picked a very small, uh, you know, scope, worked through <laughs> that and got it to the point where the, they were automatically sending out these pricing reports because of you know, built the pipeline, brought all the yeah, data yeah. in, uh, automatically sending these price line, these pricing reports out. And this guy, I got a, uh, I got an email from him. He said, last week is the first week I had dinner with my family every week in the last 10 years. And, uh, and so you, you think about, you know, how do you, how do you evangelize that in an organization? That's yeah. exactly how you do it. You get somebody like that and they're telling everybody, you know, this yeah, is yeah. the greatest thing ever. It's fixed so much for us. Yeah. You got to really explore that with the company. And I mean, this is why when you're doing a strategy, you've got to you've got to interview the business um i think that's another mistake that often you know we see this a lot where uh, we're talking to it professionals and they're asking us like okay so who do you need to interview and we'll start saying well who are the business process owners who owns the business process and they'll rattle off to us well here's our it business analysts that support those business processes and 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 it's like we're not there yet, guys. We need to talk to those people. And and then, you know, sometimes they get afraid that, well, you're going to talk to these people that are, you know, sort of our masters. <laughs> why do you want to, you know, why would you need to talk to them? Because we already do. And this is the reason why is because they'll tell us things they will not tell you. Uh, it, it's, it's, if you go back to our last uh, Data Sharks podcast we talk about the life of a consultant versus uh you know the life of an employee you know uh for one reason or another uh we the sins get told to consultants and uh and you know sometimes they're not shared internally and often it's for political reasons but because of that uh if if you you know bringing bringing on a team you want them to meet with the business because those are the wins uh, th those wins that you're talking about that are going to be so impactful that they'll carry the rest of the project forward. Um, the, the, the momentum of it will bring, uh, you know, the, the word of mouth and whatnot uh, internally. There's a, there's a couple of other things that we can do to do internally. Especially the turnaround, eventually. especially the turnaround from the requests, right? So, yeah. you know, not all, I'm not going to say all clients are like this, but, you know, you know, back in, you know, before the data warehouse, this uh, business would want a, a slice of data or want to look at data a certain way. It would take months for them yeah. to get it, right? And then all of a sudden, well, okay, we just asked the data warehouse team or the BI team, and they created this report for us 
within a couple of weeks and we're off and running, you know, and that's how everybody's, you know, another way of, you know, word of mouth travels yeah, is yeah. because of this, you know, you're providing something that they couldn't get before. It was a frustration, you know, and these, these business folk, people are telling you their the sins is because they're frustrated with the IT group, most likely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, then, and, and for the one nice part is... reason or the other, the IT, you know, they're bogged down, you know, what they're, you know, other stuff, right? That's the whole point of the data warehouse is to, to relieve that off the IT team and let mm-hmm. the business write the reports, you know, and then you start, you know, in my experience, you don't see it a lot, but there's always supposed to be that super user in each of these yeah. business groups, right? And you, that you're you're blessed if you actually get some of those in some of these groups where <laughs> they're off and running and they're creating stuff. But most of the time, it's the, you know it's the BI team that's still creating all these reports. Yeah, you know? yeah. Because sometimes, and that's a whole other topic is, you know, okay, we built this data warehouse. Now we have this metadata layer on top of it. Oh my God, where do I pull from? Where do I look at? You know, you know, yeah, they, yeah. they can get real messy. You know. Yes. Yes. Well, that is the whole. It gets into the cultural aspect of the company. I mean, do they, how are they organized and does the, who reports to who, does the business have sort of liaisons? That's all, every company has sort of their own take on that. But, um, so, so Jan, did you have fun? Yeah, no, this is, this is great. Yeah, thanks for we'll inviting We'll get them on camera next time. Yeah, uh, we'll send you some lighting for next time. Or so up, Jan. I want to have to dress up and, and get ready for this next time. My camera is <laughs> not ready today. <laughs> All right. Well, very good, folks. I uh, appreciate you, you jumping on, Paul and Rich and Jan. Thank you for uh, for joining me. And uh, we'll catch you guys uh, next week. Thanks right, so much. Have an excellent day. Have a good one. All right. Take bye. care. Bye. All right. Bye.